Reserve. And uh, we're getting a little glimpse of the place. Hi, we're in the Sands Point Reserve, and I'm here with Milton Cantel. And uh, tell me a little bit what's going on here. Okay, we're throwing right now, it's called the UFO Phenomenon Exhibit. It's going to be here for three months at Sands Point and explores all the different types of UFO sightings, what could be UFOs, what can't be UFOs, and it's fun for the whole family. So we we're basically uh, talking about aliens. We're talking about aliens, we're talking about UFOs, we're talking about sightings, we're talking about government documentation. It's, all, it's the whole gamut of UFOs. And this will be here for how long? It's going to be here till June 1st. All righty, and this is off of exit 36 on the LIE for those that are interested. Mm -hmm. um, I see here we got a ship that didn't make it. Oh, this ship almost made it. This is a replica, replica of the uh, Roswell crash back in 1947. Yeah, it's a very famous controversial crash. Mm -hmm. And it uh, looks very good, looks very real. Yeah, we try to make it look pretty realistic. And the kids like it. Speaking of kids, Tybach. Tybach. Tybach, I just want you to know that this is a crash from Roswell. What do you think? Nice, but I just think the aliens are still alive. Oh, okay. He thinks they're still alive. Right. He's right. He probably is right. You know what they say? You can't get out of this world alive. Well, maybe you can. <laughs> maybe you can. All right, we'll walk around a little bit. Now I know I'm talking to you. Project Blue Book. They're going to give away my best secrets. We're talking about Project Blue Book, which the government uh, says sometimes didn't exist. So I see we got a few things over here of interest. Uh, I got some cousins that were visiting. 1960 was a good year for wine, too. Secret Classified, Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book had thousands and thousands of documents discussing UFO sightings, and a small portion of them were never really found to be what they were. They were still classified as unknown what the origin of the UFO was. Well, I see you have a few of our weather balloons over here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 66, 62, 65, 63, the famous one of 69. That's an island park. Mm -hmm. There's been some at Stony Brook, they tell me, too. Yeah. This is an interesting case over here. This is the McNeville, Oregon, over here. And uh, Blue Book said it was a hoax, but on computer analysis, it wasn't a hoax. Looks like they're going to buy a house in Levittown. <laughs> Well, we're here at Area 51. The government really doesn't want me uh, going in here. It's restricted. But, uh, and some people say there isn't an Area 51. Well, there it is, Area 51. Uh, this was the thing in Iran telling you about an encounter between a UFO and military airplanes. Really? Yeah, these are the Foo Fighters from World War II. This is an actual picture from uh, a German reconnaissance plane, I think. And they were saying that UFO, these Foo Fighters were actually made by the Nazis, but apparently they also flanked Nazi warplanes as well, and they also hmm. were seen in Vietnam and Korea. Wow. So they've been around for a long time, and nobody knows where they are, what they come from. Just remember, folks, that the business of aliens is supposedly not real. Oh, I don't know anything about it. Here we go, folks. This is the heavy stuff. We have here an alien in the cryogenic tank. Rather frozen. Yeah, he doesn't really like being in there. They're just dating. Mm. <laughs> We're actually trembling here on the ground. They're doing a little bit of an examination. Say, ah. I can't 
played. Right, right. They might even see this out in Montauk Point. You're the alien today. <laughs> you are. <laughs> These are some IFOs over here that people mistake for UFOs. We try to uh, give some educational factors as well. Like a lot of times people mistake Venus for a UFO. Uh, missed over the moon is a UFO, asteroids. So these are the explainable sightings. I'm doing your alien on the street interview with a gray, and I have a couple of questions. Um, what do you think about New York? Uh, what's your favorite uh, baseball team? Who do you think will be running in the next election? Well, I guess you don't have much of a sense of humor. It was nice knowing you. This is what our cousins have been doing for fun. We have here a crop circle. This is how we play. Some of the aliens come down and we play with the human ground and we leave little designs just to keep the humans guessing. Klingons don't do this though. Klingons don't have the humor for this. These are hoaxes, folks. Take it from one who's a real alien. Doesn't look like me though. It's not my dad either. Hmm? <laughs> oh, this is great. The people of Earth finally got to hear the truth, but poor Orson Welles was told he had to tell it as a joke. The joke scared quite a bit of the eastern coastline. Across the United States, the panic began. It was the war of the worlds. I've got this strange feeling in my stomach. coming for us. They're coming. What do you
You're looking at the where sightings have been reported in the United States and South America. And we can go across the world. And you can see we have quite a bit of sightings over in Europe, Africa, even into the USSR. Paul, I want to thank you very much. You're quite welcome. Very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. and I hope you had a good time. Oh, I had a great time, and uh, it was educational. Mm -hmm. Learned a little bit about myself. There you go. And next time I will let more Vulcans in. Thank you very much. Okay. And this is Zenbach at the Sands Point Preserve. I think it's time for us to talk a little bit about the Montauk Project. I've had the opportunity to interview Preston B. Nichols on the Montauk Project. And we're going to show this interview in many parts. The views that you're going to hear are of Preston's. They're not of mine. They're not of CIC, the network. And we're going to give him an opportunity to speak his viewpoints. This story has been following me in many conventions due to the interest. It's a story that many people are talking about out of the area of Montauk, and even the locals in Montauk have a viewpoint, which perhaps will show you that viewpoint as well. So here's our second episode from Preston B. Nichols. This is our VLF antenna, passive one. This is our large directional loop over here. I have in the back of my van a pedestal that this mounts on. It spins and this is tuned and I can display it on a scope from the AGC of the receiver and the detectors and tell what direction it's coming from. This sort of technology and this sort of technology here is what I use to literally triangulate the 435 megahertz transmissions pulse type covers 400 to 440 megahertz in range, very fast burst chirp-like pulses, frequency hopping. I found out they're coming from the old Montauk Air Force Base known as Camp Hero State Park, Block Island, and uh, Gardner's Island. I want to mention that uh, <coughs> Ty Bach, my son, and I have been having trouble beaming in and out of this area since we relocated and uh, was suspicious of 440, 450. Right. And we did notice uh, a harmonic, which had a very unusual modulation in the... Uh, I just got to remember, pocket pages are up there, mm -hmm. 450. Yeah. And also, if you go out and you tune to 150 to 153 megahertz out by the base, it's not all pocket pages. You listen carefully. Some of that is encrypted voice. In fact, we heard a statement come over with some of my de-encryption equipment that said Morgan in parking lot one night, which was after one of the Montauk boys named Morgan did some strange bilocation ritual and put the whole base on alert. Their, uh, their encrypted channels were chattering away like mad. I noticed in your book, The Montauk Project, there was a section of that that reminded me of a favorite movie, a Disney movie. This is going to sound like child's play, but it is not. Uh, I'm talking about Forbidden Planet. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the Krell with the id. The wish machine. Yeah, now, the id. That's what and, Montauk was. Yeah, well, I, I noticed there was something called the beast. You mentioned mm -hmm. a little about the beast. Well, first, let's show the folks the beast. We'll do a close-up on this later. In fact, you really don't want a close-up that much. Well... We'll show you this. Yeah. But uh, there is a beast. We believe Junior, as I like to call him, came out of the subconscious of Duncan Cameron, went through all the equipment, was projected, and became solid and physical. This is when Duncan got his exorcism reportedly on Mars. And notice I say reportedly because I don't know exactly how true that is. Although, to this point, about five different individuals remember the Mars expeditions. 
<laughs> with Duncan being involved and Duncan standing in this grotto of rocks being handed something by Stan Campbell with Stu Swardlow. And Duncan went through an exorcism, he found God, and he decided the project had to crash. Because for millennia, the power of darkness was coming through, so to speak, and he got very bothered by it. And of course, the rest of us, we never wanted to say, yeah, let's crash the project. You don't dare say anything like that. You might find yourself with a bullet in the head and on the beach. Hmm. One of those other people killed at Montauk. But either way, it was decided to crash the project by programming Duncan. I notice I say programming. So when he heard the term, the time is now, he would blank everything and go in and bring up the picture of this primitive beast out of the subconscious. Hmm. Just like from the Krell, from the Forbidden Planet, I'm well aware that it's the same plot, basically, just done a little bit differently, a little different level of technology. But yes, you're right, it's done the same. And I didn't steal that from that. That I'll sit here on a stack of Bibles and say, it happened, we didn't steal the plot. But yes, the Montauk machine was very much like the Krell machine from Forbidden Planet. Um, what are your interests with, uh, I hate to say this, Alien civilizations, cultures? Well, I'll say 100% aliens do exist. I've met them, I've talked with them, and I'll say, folks, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't do any of that stuff. Being almost a nutcase myself, and I'll, I'll call a spade a spade, I have to keep my own sanity. I'm not going to do anything that's going to cloud my mind. Because some of the stuff I've seen, folks, it's far out there. When you see a thing that tall, with a strange head, with the eyes you see on the cover of Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, is it a hallucination? No, I was able to touch it, I was able to smell it. We took those things, threw them in the shower at Montauk because they stunk. <laughs> and at Montauk we had a thing that uh, looked like a cross between a lizard and a human being and an alligator. The Lizzies. That was known as a draconian. Mm -hmm. It was his highness. And he had very little regard for any of us here. To him, we were food, basically. And, of course, you have the tall Nordics, the Pleiadians. Right. Which, in a future show, when we go into UFO stuff, we can talk all about that. Well, the Pleiadians is a whole subject in itself. Yeah. My fourth book is, you know, Encounters in the Pleiades an inside look at UFOs. I will say at this point that in connection with my job, my government work, I've been inside UFOs. I've been inside a round ship that's about 50 feet in diameter, about 20 feet tall. When you go inside, the thing is bigger than this building. And this thing literally operated on thought. They had three chairs, three like lounge chairs that the uh, pilot, the navigator, and the engineer would sit in. And literally, your thought ran the ship. When you walked in the control room, all you saw was a number of view screens. There wasn't a knob that you could turn, a button you could push, a lever you could throw, there was nothing. When the government first captured this ship, it must have been, okay, what do we do now? This thing has no, no, no knobs, bells, buttons, or whistles. What do we do? And that's probably when they got the crane, put it on the flatbed, and took it out. And who knows how long it took them to figure out, uh, hey, how come that chair over there has all that wiring going to it? These chairs are filled with coils. And probably took them a while to figure out, you put a person in the chair and he concentrates and the thing does something. So we have a cross between metaphysics, or I'll, I'll use the term psychics, metaphysics, and application of that to the actual science yeah, definitely. and technology. Metaphysics, what's metaphysics? Meta means we don't understand it. Physics, it means physics we don't understand. Metaphysics today is tomorrow's physics, remember. Most of your metaphysical stuff can be explained by the new concepts in quantum physics. Your multi-dimensional, your multi-reality theories. Like, Time to us is a straight line because we exist in a single dimension that we're aware of. 
we're our born, minds exist in many dimensions. We're born on a planet rotating, the right. carousel of life. And if we're able is, to develop our awareness into other dimensions, other reference frames, then time is not linear anymore. If you can travel to other dimensions and reference frame, time travel is very possible, very probable. Mm -hmm. So, have you had any experience um, younger days with aliens or anything? Well, I've been abducted maybe three times. I remember as a little kid laying in bed, looking off to my left and seeing this face, human looking face, blonde hair, almost white, no eyebrows, very kind looking face, just looking in on me. When I was 17, when I was 12, I got rheumatic fever, I had a heart murmur, my folks were told I wouldn't live beyond 25, I'm 50. Something's a little funny somewhere. Yeah. And at 17, the doctor listened to my heart, said the heart murmur's gone. I don't know what happened, it's a miracle. You're healed, you're cured. You'll live long. And I also had some neurological problems before 17. I could not use tools properly as a kid. I had sort of a stutter, a speech impediment as a kid. Do you hear a speech impediment anymore? No. No. For years, I had these dreams of traveling on a spaceship, going to first a smaller planet, then boarding another ship, going to this large planet, being shown this almost utopian-like society where the buildings and the people were ergonomically integrated into the nature of the planet. The planet looked like a garden with the buildings looked like they grew there and they belonged there, not like here you threw a bunch of bricks and wood together. And I later learned that that was the planet Alderaan around the sixth sister star in the Pleiadian star cluster. And what happened, I was abducted by the Alderians, taken back, healed. Something happened with the healing, and the original being in here, known as Penny Nichols, left. They had a workable body, so they put Preston in the body. And I'm literally a consciousness from that planet. This is like a walking soul walk in soul. Then I went through myriads of education. These people, I call it the hair dryer. You put on this hair dryer, you spend about a half hour, you got a whole college course, including the experience. They loaded it in there. Of course, this is technology very much like the Montauk Project. I wonder where they got these ideas at Montauk. <laughs> and I was put back in our society as a sleeper to, at the time, around 40, 45, awaken and literally become an agent for the Pleiadians. I'll call a spade a spade. Folks, if you think I'm crazy, fine, I don't care. If you don't think I'm crazy, listen to the message. Man is meant to be free. Man is meant to have a free mind. The Montauk Project goes totally against that. Montauk Project is an attempt to enslave humanity, enslave the population. <laughs> Uh, South Haven Park. What you're looking at is the Sunrise Highway is on the other side of those trees. And this is a little lake here. And across the lake is a piece of land, part of the park. And the reason I'm here, and you're going to see this through my eyes since I'm holding the cam, and you won't be seeing me, you will hear me, is I'm searching for remnants of that famous flying saucer crash that was reported in the fall. We heard Preston B. Nichols talk about it, and it's been a discussion where I've gone before that you live 
on Long Island, and it was a famous crash covered up on a Sunday night with a fire. And this is on the east side of South Haven Park. We're standing on the west side, and those woods over there are the east side. So let's see if we can find anybody or anything to give us traces of this mysterious UFO conspiracy that's allegedly happened here in this park. Let's see if we can find anybody who knows anything. Excuse me, guys. Um, would one of you guys be interested in uh, taking an interview with me? My name's Zenbach, and you are... Don't be foul now. Let's, let's get this together now. I want to... Anybody here see anything about a UFO on the other side of the park that crashed? Anybody know anything? Does anybody here actually know anything? You, over there. You look very distinguished. Do you know anything about a UFO? I guess not. Um, how about you? Yes, do you know anything about a UFO? Oh, you going to come over here and talk to me? Whoa, leave him alone. Don't peck at him. You want to talk to me? Well. No sitting on the sign. Oh, my goodness. All right, well, we tried here. We're going to walk around the park. We want to get over there. I want to see if we can find any parts of UFOs. Okay, well, let's check the park.